So I guess this is um, the last talk for the session. Um, lunch is happening soon. So this is just one simple little idea um, to grasp before lunch. Um, so I'll talk about unit tests for stochastic optimization. Stochastic optimization we've talked about quite a bit, so um, um, you're all very familiar with this. Um, any, any method that tries to optimize uh, using stochastic estimates of, of gradients uh, is used very widely in our community, but also in other communities. And for good reasons, it's fast, it's, uh, it's easy to implement. Um, there's lots of variants out there. Um, um, we can use it because uh, these uh, stochastic estimates are cheap to get. And um, because once we do that, we can scale to arbitrarily large data sets or even infinitely large data sets where uh, there's just a stream of constantly changing things. <clears throat> and so um, there's um, a whole lot of criteria that we would like for um, the stochastic optimization algorithm. Um, most often we talk about performance criteria, like uh, the learning should be fast, we want like, the training error to go down as quickly as possible. Then we of course also care about generalization, and um, all of that should, in, in the best of all worlds, happen as, uh, with the least computational effort and with making good, efficient use of all the samples uh, that we use. Here I want to uh, say that there's maybe another criterion that is also relevant, and it's the criterion of robustness. Um, and what I mean by that is I would like the stochastic optimization algorithm that um, just works. So that works out of the box, and um, in, in a number of different ways. So it, it never diverges. Uh, it's not disrupted if there's like outliers in your data, so you don't have to be careful about cleaning things up before you start the training. Um, it works if you apply it to a new set of um, data. It, it works if you change your architecture along to swap out different kinds of nonlinearity. It just keeps doing kind of the right thing. Uh, even though the performance might not be perfect, it just works out of the box. So that's, that's the idea um, I would like to um, impress on you. Um, that this might be a useful criterion to go for as well. And, uh, and if we have that, of course, we can also, uh, we hope that this would also work in the most stationary uh, tasks like the one uh, Rich introduced this morning. And then, um, as the cherry on the cake, we would like this to work without any kind of hyperparameter tuning. So this is kind of part of this, it just works approach, where you take it and it, uh, it does the right thing. So, so far, it isn't really a candidate, uh, I think. Uh, if you know one, let me know. Let all of us know. We're, we're all be very happy to have that. But uh, maybe there's a, a, um, a way of getting one step closer to so the key idea is um, uh, that we're going to try and do um, a bottom-up approach. Instead of deriving something um, from like some kind of theoretical framework that says what are all the properties an algorithm must have to just work, um, we're going to do it empirically and we're going to say here's lots of cases where I want it to work on. And um, hopefully uh, an algorithm that works on a very wide diversity of difficulties will um, also work on, on new unseen problems. And so uh, this is the idea of this paper, to introduce some kind of test-driven algorithm development uh, where we build a large um, suite of unit tests, that's what we call these, these kind of test cases, a large suite of unit tests <coughs> to And um, uh, I, I'm not the first one to come up with this. There's actually a, a whole field of um, black box optimization where they have done this quite successfully, where they, where they, they, they built a, a suite of, of uh, small, well-understood test cases and all algorithms that you want to publish in that field kind of have to pass all of them, and you have to report on that. And I think this would be um, a healthy thing for um, stochastic optimization variants as well. So this is already the key idea. So if you're really hungry, you can go for lunch now. That was, that was the main point. Um, the rest of the talk is just a few details of what I exactly we did and some results. But the key idea is, is um, uh, was already done. Um, so um, um, a couple of the properties that we would like for these unit tests is that they are, in a sense, kind of prototypical, that they are um, realistic, they correspond to something real, uh, they, they have at least a chance of appearing in a real world problem. So we don't want to just like um, go into like worst case world. Uh, we would like them to be fast to evaluate, simple to implement, uh, kind of in, in, in from the respect that we want to understand why things go wrong. So if things go wrong, we would like to understand why. And um, um, the main criterion for this, this um, collection of, of unit tests is its diversity. So uh, uh, any um, uh, small set of, of tests can be, can be massed by a lot of algorithms. But if we, if, if we make this wider and more diverse, uh, we have a chance of, of getting something 
that is robust and that, that works. Um, so and in, in order to help things make, make things more diverse, we'll, uh, we design them so that they are scalable and composable, so that we just need to write the definitions, a couple of, a couple of definitions, and then we can combine them and scale them in arbitrary ways. And uh, we're going to make one restriction on, on the class of unit tests. We're going to assume that for now, um, the, the thing we care about is, is local properties. So what do algorithms do within like a small number of steps on kind of a small uh, part of our optimization landscape, rather than building um, whole uh, benchmark problems. Um, and this, this allows us to kind of split up the optimization trajectory into its components and say, uh, uh, an algorithm that does something sensible everywhere along the way, hopefully also does this whole trajectory. Okay, so there's um, a, a couple of like shape prototypes, our, our basic primitives that uh, represent things like uh, local optima or like long linear slopes that we descend. Uh, but we add in um, some non convex stuff, non differentiable pieces uh, with um, nastily shaped, shaped um, um, scale differences and a whole range of other things. We, we vary the scale by multiple orders of magnitude just so that things are not nicely normalized because that. I think in many real world cases isn't uh, isn't guaranteed, um, and we add in things like steep cliffs, uh, which are supposed to capture things that can happen in current neural networks, plateaus where things are flat, you don't get a gradient for a while, so you would like uh, the algorithm still to do something sensible, even if it's for a while uh, of getting any kind of information, or at least in part of its place. And then we make things harder by adding noise uh, on top of them, uh, so additive Gaussian noise is kind of the simplest thing. Uh, multiplicative noise, uh, where the noise is scaled uh, by um, uh, the scale of the gradient. But then also a mask out noise, like, like in dropout, or outliers, <coughs> to, make it, uh, um, uh, to verify that it's robust to like, dramatic differences. And, um, and then we can combine these things. So for each shape, scale, and noise level, we can kind of build one one-dimensional prototype. And then for each one dimensional, for each um, set of one dimensional prototypes, we can build multi dimensional uh, unit tests. That, uh, look for example, that for example, there's uh, on um, the right hand side, there's a, a cliff uh, on one dimension and a quadratic pole on the other dimension. We can just do an example like that. And we have a whole range of these combinations. Then, um, of course, we don't want to just um, limit ourselves to separable issues. So um, we'll, uh, once we have multi-dimensional unit test. We're going to rotate them. We're going to make, to make sure the conditioning is sometimes really bad. Uh, things are tightly correlated. Uh, we'll uh, make sure there's enough saddle points because uh, saddle points are one of the things uh, that uh, we tend to see. Uh, for example, uh, the motivation. Uh, so one, one of the inspirations for, for some of these shapes is this little study we did on, on Amnist. Um, you've seen lots of visualizations of Amnist. This is taking um, a simple two-bit and layer network, training it just for one epoch, so it's not at convergence, and then doing run, random um, two-dimensional projections and plotting how the loss surface looks like um, in any of these random projections. So you get all kinds of interesting shapes. These are for random projections. If you now take projection, if you now just take um, two random uh, weights, you get some very different kinds of uh, loss surfaces. And we would like to capture all, um, all these kind of things, hopefully in higher dimensions. For now, we're, uh, we're staying in a relatively small number of dimensions for the unit test. Um, so yeah, to, to summarize, we have now about 3,000 test cases with uh, where we vary shape, scale, noise, type of noise, um, combinations, correlation, and what kind of non-stationarity we impose on, on top of that, and up to 10 dimensions. Um, and then in order to evaluate, um, we uh, need some kind of baseline. So um, what we did is for each of the 3,000 unit tests, we tune a uh, fixed step size FGT um, carefully so that we get the best uh, performance of the simplest algorithm for each of them individually. And that's going to be our baseline. And we, uh, we would like a robust algorithm to be near, uh, near that performance on a wide range of the, of the tests. And so we're going to just look at qualitative results. Uh, we're going to categorize results in five categories. 
Um, the worst that can happen is like some kind of numerical instability. The algorithm explodes, it diverges, which we're marking red. Um, the second worst thing that could happen is uh, if it just doesn't get there. So if, if the, um, the algorithm doesn't even come close to where the best SGD um, could, could reach in, in, um, in a thousand steps. And that's an orange. And then another uh, failure mode is um, uh, early saturation. So uh, if within those thousand steps we already observed that the algorithm has stopped making progress, um, then we mark that in yellow. And then uh, green is everything that's fine. All of the algorithms that have been reasonably well are marked in green. And then in blue, uh, it, uh, yeah, it's actually substantially better than the past. Okay, and so there's um, um, 10 million experiments on this plot, so um, there's a bit of luck to take in. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it up for a couple of seconds, but there'll be a poster tonight where um, you can stare at it as long as you like. Um, these are, not, these are just half the world, there's more. Um, for, for um, let me just give you the, the sense. So on each group of rows, uh, we have one algorithm. Each individual row is one setting of the hyperparameters. Uh, each group of columns corresponds to one collection of benchmarks. For example, all the non-differentiable ones would be one of these groups of uh, columns. Each individual column corresponds to one uh, unit test. And uh, as you can see, there's a lot of orange. Um, lots of arguments just don't, uh, in, in many of their hyperparameter settings, just don't get anywhere. Um, there's quite a bit of green, so that's that's good. Green, um, all that, uh, but there's a for my uh, um, intentions, there's still not quite enough uh, full rows where it's all green across the row. So where you take one setting, one algorithm, and it's green all over, and it just solves all of them uh, reasonably well. Or just to say, uh, the, the cutoff point for between orange and green is if you get 10% of the performance of SGD. So if SGD goes from, I don't know, an arrow of 7 to an arrow of 2, and you get 10% of that progress, so you can go from 7 to 6.5, you're already green. So um, it, it's a very generous interpretation of, of what you um, A couple of, in, in, um, of observations from these plots is that um, well-tuned SGD is already hard to beat. So uh, uh, there's very, very little blue on, on these plots. Uh, it's hard to be double as fast as a well tuned step size. Um, there's a very high diversity, so different unit tests give us very different kinds of uh, characteristics across different algorithms and across different hyperparameters, uh, which is what we would like. We would like it to be very diverse. Um, uh, in, under the high noise scenario, uh, a lot of the algorithms actually saturate already. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, not very surprisingly, uh, adaptive algorithms are a little bit better. Uh, a little bit less uh, sensitive to Q, but this, I would, they're still not probably what call the robust. And um, this is what it is. There's nothing that just works in, in, the, in the set of things that we've had so far. But um, what I would like to, what I, what I hope is that this is a first step in the right direction. That given this this setup, um, we uh, we can design better algorithms, and we can design them in function of this this criterion of robustness, such that. Uh, Maybe a couple of years from now, people will say, oh, what do you want to use as an algorithm? Oh, yes, this one, and it just works. And so uh, if you want to actually try your own uh, new algorithm on all of these uh, benchmarks, there's the open source code, um, <coughs> which you can just plug in um, a little uh, function definition, uh, algorithm definition, and it's uh, in the um, in the demo, is a very simple interface, and you can run it and it generates all of these. like some methods, uh, you have many more configurations of hyperparameters than others. That's right. It doesn't look fair. That, that, that's right. Yeah. Some methods have more hyperparameters than others. Um, but the ones that have fewer hyperparameters still aren't robust. So. Are you only looking at pure stochastic or also the batch size? Oh. Uh, this is 
pure stochastic, I think you can always see uh, an increasing batch size of just reducing the noise. So uh, I don't think, in terms of unit tasks, I don't think you can make it harder by introducing batch sizes. Yes. So to me, it seems like you may already find solutions to your problem. If you have this 3,000 data sets, you're taking new data set, looking to which of those uh, artificial data sets, this new data set is more similar, and you are choosing method which was the best performing on this data set. Yeah, that's, that's actually why it's important that each of these points is not just a sample, it's actually something that is interpretable. And if you know that your new data set coming in is, I don't know, a particular kind of data that has particular kind of features, you can kind of do the subset that corresponds to these features and look, instead of which, is robust, which algorithm is robust in general, you can look at which algorithm is robust in particular to the task that you are expecting. That's right. Is it, uh, from a theoretical standpoint, is it unreasonable to expect that there would be some universal optimization algorithm? Right? We have like these no free lunch theorems that say that if any class of learning algorithm optimization does better, than other learning algorithms on a specific class because it's specialized. That's yeah. right, that's right. I mean, the, 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 but the no free lunch is kind of the worst case scenario, right? Is if you get like, you pick the maxil, maximally adversarial setup for your, for your algorithm. So if, there, there might still be a robust algorithm that works in the vast majority of problems we typically see, so that have certain kind of smoothness or certain kind of regularities. So that, that might still be the case. Okay, so then you're so then the diversity of your unit tests is not so diverse as to include those exactly. uh, coordinates. Yes. Okay. It's trying to be reasonable. Yes. Um, there's no results for that yet, but um, I think it might be possible to um, use them in, in a predictive fashion. To say, like, um, essentially going back to the, the previous question, and, and essentially saying, uh, if I have the those 3,000 data points for all these algorithms, maybe um, um, I can predict how, how good I'm going to be on a, new, uh, on a new problem, given that I know for some other problems how good I was on that. So there, there might be something that um, there's a lot of, of directions to go with that. <coughs> if there's no other questions, let's thank Tom again. <laughs>